Well, it's good. Good evening to you all. It's good to be with you. It is lovely to be with you this evening. Shall we pray before we go any further? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here without fear of persecution, without fear of opposition, without fear for our families being persecuted and opposed. Lord, we're aware that that right at this very moment, as we sit here in the, the comfort of this place, there are literally thousands upon thousands, maybe millions of your children hiding, imprisoned on the run, would absolutely delight in meeting together physically in fellowship. Father, forgive us if we ever take this for granted. Forgive us if we don't give meeting together the importance that it deserves. That we should not give up meeting together Lord, that we don't become distracted by other things and other people. But this morning, this evening, as we gather here in this place, Lord, may we both hear and receive your holy word. Lord, not only just hear and receive, but do. Lord, that we will be reminded of Things of old, old truths, the old, old story. But Lord, you will take us deeper into that story tonight. You will just peel back perhaps another little layer somewhere here or there. A little something we'd not considered before that just reminds us afresh of your greatness, of your glory, of your majesty, your holiness, and your love for us who fall so far short. So Father, as you bless us this morning, this evening, and we leave this place, may we be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this year, in a wonderful act of symmetry, and synchronicity, how's that for a word? Synchronicity. The Jewish festival of Hanukkah and the Christian season of Advent begin at the same time. Now on Sunday evening, just gone, uh, the, the Jewish people would light lit their Hanukkah menorahs in remembrance of the miracles that God performed uh, 2,200 years ago in Jerusalem. The first of those miracles was deliverance. For many, many years, the Jewish people had been oppressed by the Greeks who desecrated the Jerusalem temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. Nice. They enforced idolatry, forbidding the Jewish people, (coughs) excuse me, forbidding the Jewish people from reading the Torah and following their religion. But God delivered his people through a Jewish priest named Matthias and his sons. And they they led a, a, a relatively small group of people of men to rise up against something like 25,000 soldiers of the Syrian and Greek army. That That was the first miracle of Hanukkah. But there was more to come. When the Jewish priests finally entered the temple to rededicate it and to light the menorah, they found only one bottle of undefiled oil. Just enough to last 
for one day. Miraculously, that tiny supply lasted eight full days. Hallelujah. The second miracle was that that happened was sustenance. It gave the priests enough time to create more sanctified oil to keep the temple menorah burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, there is something very significant about the number eight, just as there is significance in all sorts of other numbers in the scriptures. But maybe that's another study for another evening. The miracle of the menorah oil has continued to be commemorated as a time of celebration, remembering God's faithfulness. Perhaps then, it's no coincidence that Jesus himself stood in the very same Jerusalem temple on Hanukkah. And he was asked directly, a hundred years after this great event, are you the Messiah? Now Jesus confirmed that to those asking that, yes, he is indeed the Messiah, the shepherd of Israel. But for the majority of Jewish people then, and, and sadly, as, as, we, as we know still today, that's not something they were able to accept. It's not that they had no concept of God's anointed one. They'd been waiting for him for a long, long time. However, three things in particular stood in their way. The first, over recent centuries, was that there'd been, there'd been many false hopes, many dashed hopes, because there were many false messiahs. They were pretenders to the throne. That they were, but then, just as their hopes were being lifted high, these pretenders to the throne were exposed and seen for what they really were. So yes, there were pretenders to the throne. But secondly, there were, there were many different expectations as to what Messiah would look like. You see, for the Pharisees, well, they wanted a Messiah who would strictly keep the law of Moses <coughs> right down to every jot and tittle. <coughs> The Pharisees wanted a Torah Messiah. <coughs> the Sadducees, well, <coughs> excuse me, they wanted something different. They wanted a Messiah who would strictly keep the sacrifices and the rituals of their religion. <coughs> They wanted the temple to run like a Swiss watch. Excuse me. So the Pharisees wanted one thing. The Sadducees wanted something quite different. Then, of course, there were the Zealots. The Zealots. They wanted a Messiah who would carry on the work of Messiah, Matthias and his sons all those years previously. They wanted Messiah to knock seven bells out of the Romans and send them with a flea on their ear because they were now the occupying forces. They were the enemy. And then not only that, there was the Essenes. They wanted a Messiah who would rescue them from all this conflict, lead them out into the desert, away from the big bad city for a life of peace and quiet and contemplative prayer. Love, peace, and Jefferson Airplane. Now, of course, the Hebrew Scriptures never promised a Messiah who would neatly fit any of these expectations. Indeed, the third difficulty 
was that the prophets had muddied the water as it seemed by painting not one, but two portraits of the Messiah. And these portraits could not have been much different if they tried. See, so if we read through the prophet Isaiah, for example, we read of the suffering servant. On the other hand, the prophet Zechariah speaks about the conquering king. The suffering servant got the conquering king. How can the Messiah be both? Are there two different messiahs? Is one right? Is one wrong? Is the other right? That one wrong? Are neither of them right? See, for many Jews, it's proved to be a conundrum too far. A Gordian knot too difficult to untie. Others, though, have tried to rationalise this by, by seeing that the, the, the images of the suffering servant apply historically and more generally to the chosen people of God themselves and how they have gone and, and still undergo opposition how they have been and, and they still go through such anguish for so many centuries now because of their allegiance to the God of their ancestors. But for us, as Christians, the problem disappears instantly. You see, we understand that there is one Messiah, but two comings here on earth. Cue the season of Advent. You see, this season of Advent is more, much more than just getting ready for Christmas. It has a theme and a flavour all of its own. There's more to Advent than chocolate calendars. And so over these weeks of Advent, these four weeks, we're invited to look back and to look forward. See, looking back, we remember the first coming or the first advent of Jesus. How he came to personify and to fulfill the Old Testament image of the suffering servant. The prophet Isaiah waxes lyrical about the anointed one of God who would be the ultimate burden bearer suffering on behalf of God's people. Jesus was this ultimate suffering servant who brought all these images into focus upon the cross of Calvary. Looking back, we can see that Jesus was the suffering servant spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. But then we have the opportunity to look forward to the second coming, the second advent of Jesus. How he will come this time to personify and fulfill the Old Testament image of the conquering king. Hallelujah, I hear you say. The prophet Zechariah, amongst others, paints this picture of a victorious warrior who will defeat evil and bring the peace of God in a way that we've never experienced before. And so as we approach what we now call Christmas, the person of Jesus will gain a higher profile and a little bit more publicity than at other times in the year. But the question is, what kind of Jesus will Joe Public be buying into? For many, he will be merely gentle Jesus, meek and mild, snuggly in his pristine crib, surrounded by adoring parents, admiring shepherds and worshipping wise men. Okay, 
There may be a little bit of donkey poo in the corner somewhere, but what's that between friends? See, the Jesus of history, as revealed to us in the scriptures, will have been a very, very different matter. For sure, he mixed with the untouchables. He welcomed the outcast. He valued children. And he gave the so-called religious elite a run for their money, sending them away with a flea in their ear. But even so, there's even more still to him than that. Now, the Apostle Paul attempts to record for us in comprehensible words, human words, something of the incomprehensible divine reality. How do you put down in human words who Jesus is? Not just who he was, but who he is. Who he really, really is. Short section now from the Paul's, St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. He said, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Wow. You see, if once you, sorry, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you, us, to, by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith. Establish them firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you've heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and which I, he says, Paul, have become a servant. How do you put down in human words who Jesus is? You see, if Jesus was merely a man, he still would have been very remarkable by any standards. But here in this letter to the Colossians, our author, the Apostle Paul, is, is making some astounding claims, is he not? You know, the visible image a visible image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. The head of the church. Firstborn among the dead. Now, through him, all things were created. Now, just stop there for a moment. Through him, all things were were created. Doesn't just Jesus say that Jesus was a partner in creation? Or he was an apprentice learning his trade? In him, through him, all things were created and hold together. And hold together. See, creation didn't just happen, and that was it. Oh, just like that. You know, we are only sitting here 
because of the grace of God because of his word that we remain here because planet earth is situated where planet earth is situated oxygen is provided by God we're only sitting here because he holds it together in all things Jesus is supreme and the fullness of God are we starting to get the message I think we are and then it comes to the last bit and this last bit is often the one that sorts the wheat from the chaff the one that causes the most difficulties in the whole area of faith and religion through him we are reconciled to God and through him only we are reconciled to God it's this one way through him and through him only that the Bible is crystal clear about now that's quite a CV isn't it that is quite a CV now some of these verses are immediately very clear they're very obvious whilst others maybe not quite so immediately clear and obvious they may be not so easily understood on first reading but let's see how Paul has combined all these together in this relatively short section and it's all loaded with Jewish idioms which come together to make a very very clear statement that Jesus is God God is Jesus so okay so the iconic image of the babe wrapped in swaddling bands lying in the manger because there was no room elsewhere does have credibility for sure but it's far from the end of the story you see that first advent that first coming of Jesus Christ into this world some 2,000 plus years ago was a watershed moment in history and we know about watershed moments in history things that happen after which life is never quite the same again you can never go back to the way it was before and the Bible tells us very clearly at just the right moment in time the Lord of all creation did something that was to change the history of the world forever see before that time sinful mankind had no opportunity to be fully fully restored to our holy God see all that religion could do all that religion can do still is to be a permanent reminder of our fallenness and provide symbolic gestures to demonstrate our heartfelt repentance but that coming that first coming was a watershed moment after which things were never the same again and that done and dusted Jesus fulfilled all that was required of him until it was time to return to his heavenly father and however there was and there is more to come this second advent will be another significant moment in history and we know I'm sure that we've read that when he comes this time it will not be in obscurity it will not be as a vulnerable baby but in triumph in glory all and as judge of all we quite like the idea of gentle Jesus meek and mild how are we when it comes to Jesus the judge of all mankind the reality is that this will be a time of sifting and separating 
It was American author, social commentator, and general raconteur, Mark Twain, who is credited with saying, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. It's not the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand. And that's what causes me the trouble. And there is a very clear and stark image given to us in the New Testament of Jesus, the judge, sitting in judgment as the divine shepherd. We know of the good shepherd, but here he is, the divine judge shepherd, viewing the flock before him, sifting and separating sheep from goats. Now, growing up in the UK, as I did, I, I didn't immediately get the enormity of this image. But it is something that we need to understand and get to grips with. Because there's subtleties in there that are quite challenging. See, back in the UK, for me, sheep looked very much like sheep. And goats looked very much like goats. The difference between them was obvious, even to a townie like me. However, for those of you who have been to the Middle East, you will know, and to some degree here in Spain too, it's a very, very different thing. The indigenous breeds of sheep and goats don't look so different, especially from a distance and with an untrained eye. The sheep don't look so different from the goats when you're at a distance, and if you don't have a trained eye. However, the shepherd, the shepherd is an expert and can, can detect the difference without any problem. Now the Bible tells us, does it not, that God does not look at us merely from the outside, but on the inside. He knows us better than we know ourselves. See, we can all, can we not, put on a pious personality. We can display a religious exterior. We can fool some of the people some of the time. We can fool ourselves probably most of the time. We cannot fool the divine shepherd who knows a sheep from a goat, whatever it might look like to us. So the question is, of course, when we come to this second advent, will we, will I, will you be amongst the sheep or the goats? Now, the key, there is a key word in this evening's Bible passage. And in one sense, it's very, very small. But in another sense, its size belies its importance. It carries enormous significance. It's the word if. If. Once you were alienated <coughs> from God and were enemies in your, mi <coughs> in your minds <coughs> because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. All. If, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. The word if. Now this faith, this gospel that we have is very specific. 
The world out, like, out there doesn't like specific faiths. It likes to mix everything together. And the whole movement, if you like, in the religious world at the moment is to come together, bring everything together, better together than apart. Let's all join together. The image of the divine shepherd is the complete opposite. Instead of bringing everything together, he's sifting and separating. And it's very clear, the only way to the Father is through the Son. And this way is a straight path, but it's very narrow. And sadly, as we read in the scriptures and as we experience in life, many, many people choose not to walk on it. But this is the way that will take us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God. And the word dominion is there to talk about a mere province, a territory or, or a colony. The word kingdom is much grander. The all-encompassing nature of a royal realm or empire. Do you want to be in the dominion of darkness or the kingdom of God? See, God's love for the world may well be unconditional, but salvation for the individual is not. God does indeed meet us where we are, but he has no desire for us to remain there. Our Heavenly Father wants to lead us onwards and take us back home. Isn't that story of the prodigal son one that comes to mind at times like this. The father ran to meet him where he was, but he didn't leave him there. He wanted to bring the repentant son back home. So God, our heavenly father, wants to lead us on and take us home. And so this season of Advent gives us a a time to, to meditate on such things. The themes of life and death and life after death. To think importantly about judgment, about heaven and about hell. Now all of this is a matter of theology. And if you are a believer, as we are gathered here this evening, I'm sure, then this is important. If we say we are believers, we really do need to know what we believe in and why we believe in it. And as believers, we can grab hold of a perspective of, of hope that says death is not the end, but it's transformed by the coming of Christ. But what about those out there who are yet to believe. How do we communicate such an urgent message without bashing them over the head with the Bible and without drowning them in doctrine? How do we get them to be interested enough to hear what we have to say? How do we get them intrigued enough to, to want to know more? How do we get them in the right sense, to be disturbed enough to want to respond. Well, we live at a time in which we're being presented with a golden opportunity to offer those around us a different perspective, another way to see things, a paradigm shift. You see, there is, is there not, a tangible sense of brokenness of things not being as they should be. Something that everybody is rumming up against daily. And in addition to the usual suspects of sickness and death and inequality, the world at the moment is being fed with fear. The world is being fed 
with fear. Be it a pestilence we've come to know as COVID-19. Be it political instability. Be it financial insecurity. Be it ecological unpredictability. Be it the pressure to conform, to abide by the code of the day, and to forfeit our ability to have a personal opinion. You see, believers and unbelievers alike do join together in the sense that the world is broken and perhaps gone mad. And over the last 18 months or so, very few have escaped that reality. For most of us, I suspect these have been the strangest couple of years in living memory. We've been through collective trauma, and perhaps the only the real, dare I were, use the word elite, seem to have come out unscathed. See, we all feel that the world is broken. We don't like it. And our collective tendency can all too easily be to downplay or deflect those feelings as quickly as we can. See, self-distraction has always been a popular coping strategy, at least in the short term. And we can all of us, we can all of us fall for a collective consumerist mania that demands that we remain optimistic. We're shiny, happy people. We're having fun, 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 despite it all. This is very different from the biblical understanding that does not deny or water down any reality, but calls for a response of faith and hope and trust in the God of the Bible. Very specifically, the God of the Bible. So as believers, we too may be anxious. We may be frustrated. And we may be a tad cynical. But fearful? Should we be fearful? Are we fearful? And by, therefore, by steering our unbelieving families and friends well away from religion, well away from religion, and introducing them to the real, historical Jesus, past, present, and future. It gives us this opportunity to offer them a better way to avoid the distraction offered by consumerism and other denial strategies that this world has for them. See, if we... If we are really sure and certain about our future and how we can face up to this brokenness, what our perspective is on life, death, and life after death, we can give them another source of hope. Whilst the world may try to dull the pain of suffering or airbrush out some of the more unpleasant elements of life on earth. The scriptures never do. But this Advent, this season of light, provides us with an open door to communicate with others how it is entirely possible for them to face up to the darkness and get to appreciate what living in the light can really mean. See, as we approach Christmas, yes, the person of Jesus will gain a higher profile and a little more publicity than usual. But what kind of Jesus will Joe Public be exposed to? This is our cue to take every opportunity to ensure that they get introduced to the real one.
Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we, as we see the clarity in your word, as we see your plans and your purposes, as we reflect on how you've been faithful in the past, we can trust in your faithfulness for the present and walk forward in certainty of your faithfulness in the future. But Father, help us to have your heart of yearning for those who do not know you. Those who are just not interested. Help us to find a way to engage. Those who perhaps have been let down by the past maybe individuals or, or by churches or by religion in some way. Help us to be agents of healing. Lord, help us to them not only to wonder at the faith we have, but to want what we have. What it means to be filled with your spirit to be escorted through the valley of the shadow of death by the good shepherd and to be certain, sure and certain of our place to be with the saints as they go marching in. So Father, help us in all of this and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening.